All right, let's do this. So man, when I have back-to-back -back classes, it should be a law that they have to be in the same room. So I just set up and set up shop. Uh, all right, so I want to talk just br very briefly about homework one and specifically about test cases. For test one, the test cases were given to you. Uh, for test two, the big thing was to make sure you're comparing your doubles with some tolerance so the truncation errors don't bite you. And uh, part of test two was going through the data, going through the cities.csv, finding a couple countries with not too many cities in them, manually computing the average population, and coding those as your test cases. It's a little bit of work, but it's not, it's not overwhelming, and you know what needs to be done for that. Uh, for test three, things get a little bit trickier, and I want to kind of spoil a test case for you. Uh, I'll do this from time to time, usually on Fridays. Um, since today's the last day for test three content, you already have everything you need to know to do it, but I want to give you a, a get started on the testing. So for above average cities, I have an incorrect solution in Autolab called something, uh, I don't remember the exact thing, but uh, accepts cities that are exactly equal to the average population. I forget what I call it in Autolab. But what this incorrect solution does is if a city has exactly the average population, it's going to be considered an above average city, even though by definition it is not above average. Equal to the average is not above average. That should not be returned. Uh, that incorrect solution does accept it, and it'll return a list with a city in it, uh, with that city in it. So you need a test case that's going to identify that solution as incorrect. So you need a test case where you have a country where one of its cities has exactly the average population. Now, that can be a tough one to, to come up with. You go through the cities CSV file, and for every city, try to find, or every country, find a country with a city exactly equal to the average population. First, you need the average population to be a whole number. Uh, that alone is a little bit, a bit of a challenge, and uh, it's just tough to do. So I want to spoil this test case for you. There's a really easy way to guarantee that you get a city with exactly the average population, and that's a country with one city. If you have a country with only one city in it, that city's population has to be exactly the average population. And the above average cities for that country should be an empty list. There's nothing to return. There's no above average cities. There's only one city. A single city can't be above average. It's exactly average. So you have the task of going through this data and finding a, a country with only one city, which can be tedious. I think uh, next time I run this assignment, I should have it as like, um, probably would have to be test three, but have a task which computes, uh, returns a map, mapping countries to the number of cities in that country. Uh, this is something I did to generate test cases in Autolab. I ran some code that did that, found the cities with very, uh, countries with very few cities, and then use those as my test cases in Autolab to test your code. So I don't have to compute the average population of a country with thousands of cities. Uh, it just gets tedious. So that's the task we have. Scrolling through this list and trying to find it. And it goes by quick. It's very hard to see it. Right there. There's a country with one city. Just to save you the time of scrolling through this, you know, that has nothing to do with the content of the course. Scrolling through data and finding that, that country. That Lowercase i looks like the lowercase l, so if you're scrolling, it'll just be a blur. But there you go, line 74. I would expect everybody to have that test case for this city, or for this country. All right, and while I'm thinking about the project, before we go into slides, anybody have questions about the uh, Discord, about the homework? You're good, yeah. Yeah, you're good. Did, did you find a different country with one city, or did you uh, do something more complex? Okay. I passed my test cases. I submitted Okay. Yeah, if you got it without that one. Either you found another country with just one city, or you found, yeah, you, you got something. You got it. 
You don't need this test case, no. Uh, and I forgot a, a little disclaimer. Autolab was down for a bit yesterday. If you have any issues, that wasn't, that wasn't a you problem. That was a, a server problem. We had, uh, unfortunately, eight hours of downtime. It was very stressful, a very stressful situation. Uh, I spent most of my day yesterday just doing that, just fixing Autolab. Uh, it was a hardware issue. We had a hard drive go down. So it took a while to get things spun back up in a stable state and to even find out that there was a hard drive error. It was not a fun day for anyone. Um, especially when you're submitting and not getting feedback or your job crashes or something. Uh, very stressful for everybody. We got past it. It seems to be in a stable state at this point. Um, but I just wanted to mention that that, uh, that was a, a serious situation. It wasn't just a few of your submissions. If you were submitting yesterday, that got broken. It was a, a big, big stressful issue. Right. Oh. Is the application objective due the same day as task three? It's the application objectives are always due on the task three deadline of that assignment, but not the task three expected deadline, the actual deadline for task three. Uh, so the intent is if you're following the expectation of the course, you're hitting all the expected deadlines, and then the week of that application objective, there's no expected deadlines. You're expected to work on the application objective is the intent. So they're effectively weekly tasks for you to do. Uh, every week. If you're not hitting the expected deadlines and you're starting to fall behind and starting to hit the actual deadlines, you don't get time to work on the application objective. That's, that's just the way it's built. That's the way it's designed. Uh, but that's your way to catch up. You miss the application objective, but then you're back on the expected path. Oh, I didn't read this. And all the deadlines are spelled out explicitly on the schedule. Like in the syllabus, I say when the application objective deadlines are. But if you have questions like that, the ground truth is right here. Listed right on the schedule, September 28th. OK. Who's excited for memory diagrams? Let's do this. I'm excited too. I'm glad. Glad you're on board. All right. Uh, today's lecture is two memory diagrams. I gotta get you ready for that quiz next week. So uh, here's the rest of your memory diagram instruction. Most of you have had labs, so you've had some help in lab to get used to these memory diagrams as well. So uh, let's give you some more practice, more exposure to these things. And I want to focus on two specific things in the examples today. This one, I'm going to focus on scoping rules, and we're gonna. I have this example that's built to be really confusing. Uh, all I'm doing is subtracting x minus y. I would expect 5 minus 2 to be 3 and for 3 to be printed to the screen. But are we sure that this subtract method works? It's written in a really terrible, convoluted, horrible, horrible way. And we're going to use that to talk about scoping rules. And then the next example in your quiz on your, your lab this week, uh, the sample quiz, you saw an array. And on your quiz, there will be one question with an array, but we haven't seen a memory diagram with an array, so the second example is going to give you exposure to that. So let's jump into it. Let's do this. So our memory diagram, we're going to split it into stack and heap. And the stack is going to be split by name and value. And we're going to have a section for input-output where we're going to have everything that's printed to the screen. That's our structure of a memory diagram that we're going to use all semester. For this example and the previous example, we're not even using the heap. But I want to have it there because it is part of just how we're going to draw these things. Uh, the second example today will actually use the heap very briefly. And we're going to start tracing through, starting from the main method. We always start at the main method. And we're going to put a few variables on the stack. This should be pretty familiar. I know it's only the second memory diagram example. But after lab as well, for those of you who've had it, I know we have a lab tonight still, which is uh, kind of wild having a Friday night lab, but it is what it is. Um, but you should be getting used to seeing variable declarations. We're going to declare variables with names x and y with the values 5 and 2 respectively. Throw those on the stack. I don't have too much to say about that. That should be old hat by this at this point in time. Was the schedule structure inspired by real programming jobs? Well, I guess kind of. Put a long story short.
Oh. I'm fine with off-topic questions, by the way. I won't always answer them, but, but yeah, it, it kind of is. But without details about your uncle's work schedule, it's, it's tough to say. Uh, it's kind of built on sprints, but really the, uh, really the schedule is built out of a necessity of I only got 15 weeks to cover material, and the material has to go quick. So the schedule is built to keep you on track, and uh, that's why I have a bunch of deadlines. I used to have fewer deadlines, but there were bigger deadlines. In one semester, I even tried everything due on the last day of class, which was horrible. Half the class failed, and it was a huge nightmare. Um, so now I lean towards too many deadlines rather than not enough, because it helps keep students on track, and more of you will pass this class with more deadlines. It's just what I've lived through is uh, that's how it works. Uh, so more deadlines, and then I get to see more of you pass and move on to 220-250, and I want to see that. Um, so it's more based on that. But it does kind of resemble work schedules with sprints where you're, you have constant deadlines with your software as well. That's common in industry as well. It's just generally a good idea, I suppose. Um, humans tend to be, we all tend to be very deadline driven. But anyway, I don't, I don't want to go too far on that tangent. We're going to get to a method call. So we're going to have a stack frame added to the stack. And we saw one of these in the last example, so this should be starting to feel a little familiar, but I still want to go through the steps because you've only seen one of them, at least in lecture, aside from lab. So we're going to add the return variable to the stack, the name of the return variable, with no value. The value is going to be assigned when the method returns. We're going to add the stack frame as a solid box, and we're going to label the name of the method that's being called, so we have an idea of what this stack frame is, what it's being called for, from. Uh, this is the subtract method, so we're going to label it subtract. And we're going to draw an arrow from the upper left corner of the stack frame over to where the return value is going to go. So this return value is going to be assigned to the variable z in the main stack frame, so that's where our arrow is going to go. This, uh, I'll repeat this quite a few times this lecture, but this solid box, we draw it as a solid box because these boxes cannot be crossed, meaning that we can't access the variables outside of this box, outside of the stack frame, when we're inside this stack frame. And we're going to start talking about this word scope. I'm gonna, this may or may not be a new vocab word for you, so scope. Scoping is... Uh, determining which variables can currently be accessed. These variables that are outside of the currently running stack frame, we said that they are out of scope. Any variables that are inside the currently running stack frame, well, once we get there, well, I can't even say that. But these variables we say are out of scope if they're not in the currently running stack frame. Stack frames run in complete isolation of each other, so whatever stack frame is currently executing, right now the subtract stack frame that's the variables in that stack frame are the only variables that even have a chance of being accessible. Inside the stack frame, we're going to put the variables x and y from the parameter list onto the stack and assign them the values of the arguments, which are x and y with the values 5 and 2. So we get another x and y with the values 5 and 2. This will be a, a theme of this example. Of course, you can see the code. You're, you can probably see, look ahead and see what's going to happen. We're reusing a lot of variable names. Right now, we have two variables named x and two variables named y in memory on the stack. So when I say print x, print y, or I access those variables, what value am I going to get? At the current point in time, they have the same values anyway, so it's not too interesting of a question yet. But oh boy, we're going to get there. Uh, so we're going to declare z, assign it the value x. x, we're going to find x inside the stack frame with the value 5, so z gets the value 5. For what it's worth, at this point, we do access this x, we cannot access this x at this point in time. All right, and let's hit our first, oh, I want to pause there, actually. 
So any questions up till this point uh, before we get into code blocks? I haven't talked about code blocks yet. So I want to make sure everybody's on board with stack frames, the structure of our memory diagrams, putting variables on the stack with values. Any questions about any of this before we start making this more complex? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so inside the stack frame, this x and y are the x and y from the parameter list. And they're assigned the values of the arguments when we call the method, which were 5 and 2. Let's do some code blocks. So we hit our first code block. Whenever we hit an open brace, our open brace right here, that's not part of a method definition, we're going to create a new code block on the stack. We're going to denote these by dotted lines, dotted dashed boxes, and I like to think of these as semi-permeable. Like a stack frame is a solid box. You can't cross those lines ever. You just can't do it. Uh, yeah, you can't do it on the stack, I'll say that. When we get to the heap, there will be different things. Um, but the dash line, we can sometimes cross that boundary. Sometimes. And that's what we want to talk about today. What do you mean sometimes? When can I and when can't I? That's what we're going to talk about scoping, and we're going to find out when exactly you can and can't cross those lines. So we hit our first code block. Now everything... Every variable that's declared inside the code block in the code is going to go inside that code block in memory. This is a separate portion of the stack. And whenever we have a for loop, technically the iteration variable is outside of the braces physically, but it is part of the code block for the loop. So I is going to be declared inside the code block for the loop. And we know code blocks like stack frames are going to be removed from the stack, removed from memory when they end. This is why when you try to return something, uh, when you try to return down here, like we don't have access to I. We can't return I. Probably something you, you tried in 115. I think everybody tries it when we start learning how to program. You try to return the iteration variable. Well, it's not going to work that way because it's in the scope of the loop block. So we're going to initialize I to zero, we're going zero until two. Until is exclusive of the endpoint, so we're iterating over zero and one. For my lecture example, I just want a loop that only iterates a few times. Two is the perfect number. It's enough to get the point that it's a loop, but it's not too much where I'm just saying, and then it does it again. So we're gonna iterate zero and one. So our code blocks are where we're really gonna talk about scoping rules. Oh. Should have these on the next, eh, doesn't matter. So now that we have a code block and a stack frame, let's talk about those scoping rules. We're gonna talk about them quite a bit, especially when we get a few more X's on the stack. So the variables outside of the stack frame are out of scope. We've already established this. You can't cross the, the solid lines. This x, y, and z, which technically doesn't exist yet. It doesn't get declared until after the return value, but uh, we do draw it on the memory diagram. Uh, these variables can't be accessed. They are out of scope, which means we cannot access them right now. Anything in the currently running code block is in scope. Whatever code block we're currently executing code in, any variables that were declared in that block, always in scope. The iteration variable here, when we get x on the, the stack, uh, the x equals 20 on the stack, those are going to be in scope. They're inside the currently executing code block. Where we have to think about our scoping rules is anything else. Some things that are inside the same stack frame, but not in the currently executing code block. These variables are sometimes in scope. So they're going to be in scope unless a variable with the same name is already in scope. 
If a variable with the same name is already in scope, then it's not in scope. Right now, we don't have variables of the same name inside the stack frame yet. I is in scope automatically because it's in the currently running code block, and that doesn't conflict with the names over here. So X, Y, and Z are all in scope at this moment in the execution. But that's about to be false. So val X equals 20, I'm gonna put X equals 20 in, excuse me, inside the loop code block. And this is valid code. By the way, I'm not, not pulling a fast one or anything. You can run this code, it's in the repo. Uh, you can run this and it compiles, runs. I claim it does actually return three, uh, but we'll see that through the execution. So this is valid code. You can have multiple variables with the same name as long as they're not declared inside the same code block. So this X is declared inside the loop code block this X is declared inside this stack frame, but outside of the loop. And this X is declared in a different stack frame. Completely valid code. But now what happened, this is the currently running code block. So I and X, these, this I and this X are in scope automatically. So that means this Y and Z, there's no name conflict. So these are in scope, but this X equals five is no longer in scope. And this is our big scoping rule that we, we need to think about. That X is no longer in scope with the value five. Neither of the X's with value five are in scope. Which means when I access X right now, I would get the value 20. And I would not be able to access that value of five. It's out of scope right now. We say that this X is covered up by this X. Can't access it. No, and I want to stress, this is valid code. I, I'm going to have, we're going to end up with four X, X's on the stack. I have four variables named X, three of them in the same method. Uh, this is valid code, so please don't do what a couple of students do each semester. You'll get something like this. You'll get a scoping question on the quiz, something that asks you to keep track of the scope of variables. Please don't write, this code doesn't compile, you reuse variables, you fool. That's not the right answer. I promise for the quiz, we're going to give you code that compiles, it runs, everything's fine. Uh, so don't write that. A few people like to think it's a trick question each time. Uh, it's not a trick question. I want you to draw a memory diagram. Okay, the conditional is false, so we're gonna hit the else. That's another open brace, that's another code block. So now we have a code block inside of the for loop code block. We're a few code blocks deep. We hit a new code block, so we get to reuse variables again. So now I can get a fourth X on the stack. I'm gonna say X equals one inside the else code block. Perfectly valid code. And then I have a big question on the next line. Z minus equals X, recall this is shorthand for Z equals Z minus X, so I'm computing Z minus X and storing the result in the variable Z. But I got four X's on the stack. So which X is going to be used? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so it's gonna be the, the innermost code block instance of that variable. So let's go through the process. I wanna show you what, the, what Scala is actually going to do, what its process is, and in fact, any language. Uh, any language is going to do something similar to this. So we need to find X. We're gonna start our search in the innermost code block. Whatever code block we're currently executing code in. Oh, by the way, the, you, can, you know, this is probably intuitive, but the green arrow is where we're currently executing. We're currently executing in this else block. We're currently executing right here in this else block. So we're gonna look there for an X and we're gonna find one. Cool, our search is done, that's it. Easy day. So X is going to have the value one in this line. The X is 20. That's out of scope, the X of five is out of scope. This X of five is not even in the same code block, so that one never had a chance, but it's out of scope as well. So we get X equals one. And then for Z, we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna start in the innermost code block, but this time we don't find a Z. The else code block says, I ain't got a Z for you. 
So we're going to continue our search by continuously expanding to the next code block. Next code block is the for loop code block. We're going to ask this for loop, hey, you got a Z for me? It's got an I, it's got an X, it's going to say, hey, sorry, I ain't got a Z for you. We're starting to panic a little bit. Of course, you can see the Z where it is. You know where we're going to end up. But we're, we're going to start panicking a little bit because our next step is the stack frame. The stack frame is our last chance to find this variable. Luckily, we do find it. We ask the stack frame, hey, you got a Z for me? It says I got an X, a Y, and hey, I do have a Z. So we find this Z and we get the value 5. If we don't find the variable in that stack frame, we don't have another step to go. The stack frame was our last stop. That was our last chance to find the variable. You don't find the variable, and by the time you get to the stack frame, and the stack frame doesn't have that variable name, you get a variable not found error, and your program crashes. You have to find it before you hit the edge of the stack frame, because as we know, we can't cross this solid line. We can't cross this solid line and say, hey, maybe there's a Z over here we can do something. No, you can't exit the stack frame. Uh, you'll get your variable not found, program crashes. In Scala, program doesn't run at all, doesn't compile, variable not found. We did find our variable, though. We got our Z of 5. We're going to compute 5 minus 1. And we're going to have our first variable update. When we up, the, oh, yeah. No, because the if didn't execute. Yeah, we're, we're only following the execution of the program. So we don't, like this code can be, this code will never be ran in this example. I could type whatever I want there, uh, as long as it compiles. Uh, I believe I have this for negative values, that is what that would handle. But for this call, 5 minus 2, it won't be executed. Any questions about scoping? That was our big scoping one, scoping part of this. Yes? If it's out, outside of the main method? Oh, that's not in any of these methods? Uh, that, that's going to be a variable at the object level, which uh, I won't throw that at you for LO1, but LO2, we're going to start talking about that. We'll see that a lot. When we start talking about classes, we're going to have classes uh, with variables outside of the methods and then create objects of those types, and they'll have object-level variables. Those are, going to go, uh, those are going to end up going on the heap, and uh, it'll be a lengthy conversation when we get there. It'll take uh, a week or so. We'll talk about it, though. Uh, but that would go... If I did have, like, above subtract, if I had def, you know, whatever, that would be in the heap in an object with the name of whatever object this is wrapped up in. Uh, any other questions? But in a different code block. Can you access a variable that's in the same stack frame but in a different code block? Yes, we just accessed Z. Z was in, not in this code block, but it was in this stack frame. Not in this code block, but in the stack frame. So absolutely we can. As long as there's no variable with the same name in an inner, more inner code block that's closer to the code block that's executing. All right, let's burn through the rest of this example. That was the big, big tricky part. Um, let's burn through the rest of this, get through the next iteration of the loop, and move on to the next one. Uh, this is our first variable update. When we update a value stored in a variable, we're going to cross out the old value and write in the new value. The idea of these memory diagrams is we want a, a complete picture of the entire execution of the program. So we don't ever want to erase anything. We're just going to cross things out when they're no longer in memory. So that flat 5 is not in memory. It's replaced with a 4. We do that by crossing it out and writing the 4. So when you hand in your quizzes, what we want is a quiz that shows you know, uh, we want to be able to know that you understand the entire execution of the program. So never like erasing 5 and writing 4, we're crossing it out. So then we can look at it and say, okay, they knew that it was 5, it got updated to 4, got updated to 3, etc. So cross it out, write the new one. We hit the end of the else block. 
So we're going to cross out that else block. That's no longer in memory. That x equals 1 is no longer in memory. And this x with value 20, which we never end up using in this code, but that x with value 20 is back in scope. It's back, ready. It's in action. It's ready to do its thing. We hit the end of that iteration of the loop. So we're going to update our loop variable. I advances from 0 to 1. Let's cross it out and write the 1. The next line, this one's a little bit controversial. And by that I mean Paul and I, so Paul co-teaches uh, this course with me in the um, spring semesters. Uh, we debated this quite a bit about what to do here. This is, what we, this is what we ended up going with for the memory diagrams. We have a value that's being redeclared in a for loop. So when the first iteration of the for loop ended, what actually happened is that x with the value 20 was erased from memory. It doesn't exist anymore. We go up to the next iteration of the loop, and then a brand new variable called x is created. A new variable is declared. So we are getting a brand new x in memory. But each time we iterate a loop, it would get, uh, it would get very cluttered to just keep rewriting these variables like that each time. So if I cross out x and then write a new x and then cross that out each time we hit an iteration, it'd get messy. It's just a lot of extra tedious writing. So this is what we went with. Cross out the value and then rewrite the new value. Even though a new variable was declared, we're going to cross out the value and use the same space on our memory diagram as the old variable. So it looks strange, and I, did, I purposely used a veil because on the memory diagram, it looks like we reassigned to veil, but we didn't. We actually created a brand new variable. We're just reusing space in our diagram, which, in fact, when the program runs in all likelihood, that new x is going to take up the same memory address, the same location in memory as the old one. Um, so we are kind of simulating what is actually going to happen as well. Um, we're saving space, just like the compiler is going to save space, or the interpreter is going to save space. It looks weird here. I'm crossing out 20 and just rewriting 20 in this case. It's not super interesting. But that could be a different value. So we cross it out and write the new one to show that, hey, something did happen here. Even though we still have an x, it still has a 20. Um, we're still going to cross those out. This is one of those things, and I'll say this throughout the semester, this is one of those things where if that was your only mistake, you didn't cross out 20 to rewrite 20, uh, I still want to give you the application objective. As long as you get everything else, all the concepts right. Uh, this is a very small thing, but, but technically this is the correct thing to do. Cross it out and rewrite it. We hit the else again. We got a new code block. Declare x equals 1. z minus equals x. Update z. End of the else block. End of the loop block, cross that out. It's no longer in memory. This x is back in scope. And then we're going to return z. z has the value 3. So 3 is going to be returned to this z as our return value. Stack frame's over. Cross out the stack frame. 3 is printed to the screen. Don't forget your input output. Print 3 to the screen. For what's worth, another nuance, I don't even know if I should mention this one, but technically we cross out this one. If you don't cross out that one, I ain't going to get mad at you. I used to have a whole bunch of slides where I never crossed out the iteration variable. But technically, that's the way the notation is working. All right, any questions on this example? Cool. Let's, let's plug along. Ready for another one. I promised you an array. I'm going to give you an array. So arrays are actually going to go on the heap. We'll see in a second how that works. For the lab quiz next week, we're going to uh, LO1, Learning Objective 1, is all about the stack when we're talking about memory, not heap. Uh, we are going to put an array on the heap, but when you get the quiz, we're going to show you an example diagram with the array already on the heap. And the array will be the very first line of the program, declaring an array. So you'll already have the array in your memory diagram. So you wouldn't, don't have to memorize anything about the heap. And starting in two weeks, we'll talk about the heap extensively uh, until you're sick of hearing about the heap. 
Uh, but for now, we'll have an array on the quiz, just like in the sample quiz we had one array, but we will show you how that's represented uh, so you don't have to memorize it. But I do, I better show you in lecture how it works if I'm going to throw it at you on the quiz. Uh, so we're going to go through this program. This is a slightly modified version of this program that we saw a couple times now. I think I showed it twice. Did we do testing on this? No, I don't think I did test cases on this one. Um, but we saw this earlier. I'm just splitting a string on semicolons and returning the percent of the values in that string that were true. Not super exciting, but it's going to uh, help us talk about all the things we need to talk about here. So let's set up our memory diagram, stack and heap, stack split and name and value, and a spot for our input outputs. Start with the main method. We're going to put a variable on the stack. We declare a variable. We have the variable test input with the value of a string, true, semicolon, false. Now, as I mentioned before, strings are a lot more complex than what I'm showing here. We're just going to throw strings on the stack. Strings are much more complicated than this. They actually go on the heap and their references, and there's a lot going on with them. Uh, to keep things simple for 116, I don't really care about any of that. I don't need you to know exactly how strings are represented accurately. Uh, we're going to represent them the way they behave, and they behave as though they were on the stack. So just to keep things simpler for 116, so we can focus on what we need to focus on for this class, I'm throwing strings on the stack. So we have a string on the stack, true, semicolon, false. We have a method called compute percent true, a solid box, uh, put our return variable on the stack with no value, and put the name of the method that was being called on the side of the stack frame that we created with our, did I say the arrow? With the return arrow going to the return variable. We're going to put the parameters, just one in this case, on the stack. So the parameter line gets the value of the argument, which is true, semicolon, false. That's, your parameters are always the first thing to go on your stack frames in your memory diagrams. And then we get to our array that we want to talk about. So first, before we get to the array itself, we have line.split. We're calling a method. That we're calling the split method. Methods create stack frames, right? Stack frames, we put the parameters on the stack, and then we any local variables, any other method calls are separate stack frames. There's a lot going on with, uh, with this method call. Uh, so we got to go into the code for the split method and see how that works and dig through Scala source code. Nah, let's not do that, right? Can we skip all that? Whenever we have a method call that's not code that we're writing, that we wrote, that's given to you on the quiz, that you have clear access to, we're not putting it on our memory diagram. So we're just going to know what line.split is going to return and put that in our memory diagram. We're not messing around with that dot .split method call. We're not putting that stack frame in our memory diagram. Um, it's, it's just, it would just be way too much. We'd probably never get through a single memory diagram if we go through all of Scala's, uh, Scala's calls. The so line.split is going to return an array, or a reference to an array. It it's, has an array true and false. So we're splitting on semicolons. So we're looking at line. Looking for semicolons, we find one, and we're going to separate the values true and false into separate values in an array. That array goes on the heap. So I had that list in Boolean string double. Uh, array was not on that list of things that go on the stack. It's part of the everything else. Everything else goes on the heap. Yeah. What's that uh, zero? I, I'm, I'm getting there. I'll get there. Cool. Uh, so this goes in the heap. The heap, I'll keep the conversation short for now, and then in LO2 we'll talk about the heap a lot. Uh, right now, it's memory that's not part of our stack. It's anywhere else in memory. We're going to ask the operating system, hey, give me memory for an array that can store two strings, and we get memory somewhere. We don't know where, and to be honest, we don't even care where that value is, where this array is in memory. But we do need a way to access it. So what we will get is a reference, a memory address, that we're going to call a reference, that tells us where in memory to find our array. 
And that's this 0x500. Uh, the number here, I just made it up. The number doesn't really matter, but it is, uh, there's no meaning to that number, I should say, to us. But that's going to be where we can find it. When I made this slide, I just said, mm, I'm feeling 500. Uh, and I put 500 up there. What, that, what matters about that memory address is what's going to be stored in the splits variable. Oh, man, I'm off by a slide. What's going to be stored in that splits variable is that memory address. That variable doesn't actually store an array. It stores a reference to, of where we can find an array in memory. In my example, I happen to choose 500. The OX means that it's a hexadecimal value. So the hexadecimal value 500 or 500. It's not a, a decimal 500. And then we're going to add that reference onto the stack. That's what's actually stored in memory on the stack in our computers when we're running our code. And we're going to draw an arrow to that memory address, to where that is in memory. And in this example, it happens to be a reference to an array with two values, two strings, true and false. So that's how we're going to annotate our arrays. That's a value that's on the heap. And then our variable stores a reference to that value on the heap. So the 0500 is the location of where to find that array. Uh, I could remake this slide and have OX200, 250. I, I can just choose whatever number I want. It's hexadecimal, so I could say CAB. That could be the location. As long as what's stored in the variable matches what's over on the heap, that's what's important. But the value itself isn't important for that. For each time you see references on a slide, I literally sat at my computer and said, what number do I feel like putting here? But it matters where they match. Wherever 500, OX500 shows up, it's a reference to that array. And we draw an arrow whenever we have a reference, just to make it 100% clear that that is referencing that array. That's how we're going to store arrays in memory. Uh, the rest of this we've pretty much seen before. The iteration I want to spend a little bit of time on, but we can cruise through a lot of this. True count equals zero, put that on the stack. And then we're going to iterate over the values in that array. So for value in splits, we create a code block for our for loop. We have the iteration variable value, which is going to iterate over splits, which is a reference to this array. And we start at the first value, true. So value is going to get the value true as a string. I'm going to create a variable value as Boolean that converts the string to a Boolean. I don't have double quotes around this because it's no longer a string. It's a Boolean value. No quotes around Boolean values. And I'm going to say if value is Boolean. If value is Boolean, that's true. So we have if true. Execute this code, true count plus equals 1. We're going to increment true count. Cross out the old value, write in the new value. Now this conditional, notice I didn't draw a code block for the if statement. If you don't declare any variables inside a code block, you don't have to draw the dashed box. Just to reduce clutter, or else I would have an empty dashed box here, and then I just cross out an empty box. It would make our memory diagrams messy for no gain. So you can draw your empty boxes, I'm not going to stop you. But they are optional. You don't have to draw your empty boxes if you have a conditional where no values are declared, no variables are declared inside that code block. So I didn't draw my if statement code block in this case. I chose not to because there's no variables declared inside of it. It'd be a waste of space. Uh, so I get the next iteration of the loop. We're going to cross out our iteration value true and move on to the next value in the array, false. And here we have the same situation as that x equals 20. We crossed out 20 and rewrote it, except now we get to see the benefits of actually doing that. We're not just rewriting the same value. We actually are getting a different value. We have a whole new variable with a different value. We're just going to cross out the value and reuse where we wrote value as Boolean, just so we don't have to cross out value as Boolean and write it again, because that's silly. We're going to reuse what we wrote here and just update the value, which is now false instead of true, as a Boolean. The conditional doesn't execute, so nothing to do there. 
The loop is over. We're going to cross out our loop. Those variables are no longer in scope. They're no longer in memory at all. We're going to compute this to return variable. To return is true count, which is 1.0, divided by splits that length. Splits that length is two. We have two variable, two values in this array, an array of size two. So we get one divided by two. We got the 0.5 which I had some confusion in the old lecture. I shouldn't have chose 500 for this because it's looking like the 0.5 and the OX500 are related. They're not related at all. The 0.5 is that 1.0 divided by the int 2. Then I'm going to return 0.5, cross out the stack frame, get my return value where it's supposed to go, follow the arrow. Don't forget to any print statements. Don't forget to write them in your output. Print 0.5 to the screen. And the program's over. Any quick questions about that? OK. I, try, I had a bad habit last semester of always showing the lecture question at like 50 on the hour. And then you had to rush to get it and get to your next class. I'm trying to be good about giving you a few minutes to do the lecture question. I've been hitting it pretty good this semester. So you can get the question in and get to your next class. But um, have a great weekend. I'll see you all Monday.